If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to take those and open to Psalm 73 in readiness for the passage we're going to look at. But before we really begin, I'm going to ask you a question. Now, it's not a question we normally ask in church. I want to know, have you ever had doubts about your faith? And I'm not talking about small doubts or anxieties. I'm talking about these gut-wrenching, soul-squelching doubts. Have you ever had thoughts? I wonder if this is all a lie. I wonder if I've been snookered. Is Christianity true? Is there even a God? And if there is a God, why is there so much pain and suffering? If there's a God, why do we see so much evil in our world? Have you ever had something that shook you to your very core, which made you want to just maybe walk away from this thing called faith? Maybe I should change that question. Who hasn't? Haven't you had times in your life where you doubted and you wondered, how can I believe all of this? And I'm going to suggest to you that's, that's common for all of us. Well, if you've ever struggled with doubt, and I bet you have, this psalm is for you. In this passage, Asaph is going to open up his heart as he experiences a crisis of faith. Now, I've got to explain to you Asaph for a second. I I didn't say ASAP, A-S-A-P, as soon as possible. Somebody was really confused last night. This has an H on it. Who is this guy? I've got to tell you, he's not your normal church member. In fact, about a third of the psalms are actually written to him. He's the choir director. And so you're going to see for the choir director instructions about how to lead this song or or sing it. And so many of them are written to him, for him, and about 12 psalms, not about, 12 psalms, Psalm 50 and then Psalms 73 through 82 are written by him. You see, he's, he's one of the main leaders in Israel. He's one of three chief uh, musicians. We can read about Heman and Ethan. But actually, he's the one that's most prominent. You can read, for example, in 1 Chronicles that he is the leader of the Levitical choir. And 2 Chronicles actually says this man named Asaph is a prophet of God. And so this is a significant person. In fact, if you're going to attend any religious festival in Israel, he's the very first one on the stage. He was the one you would have first seen or heard. And so he was, he was prominent. Uh, not, not just the music director, but really even the one that would be the one who spoke and addressed the congregation. He was, if you will, the Billy Graham of his day. He's the one everybody looked to for spiritual guidance. And yet, this man, this great leader, this prophet of God, he comes to a point in his life where he's ready to throw in the towel. He's ready to walk away and say, I'm not sure I can handle this anymore. He experiences a crisis in faith. Now, what I want to do is, I hope you have your Bibles open. I'm going to kind of walk down through this psalm. And I want you to notice, first of all, as he experiences doubt. I'm going to start with verse 2. Don't worry, I'm going to pick verse 1 up again. But notice the experience of doubt, and we read, as we get to to verse 2, we read these words. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. He's recounting a time in his life where he really was ready to throw in the towel. These are the words of a potential backslider. He's ready to walk away from everything he was groomed for, everything he was trained to be. He's, He's ready to walk away from God. Don't underestimate these words, words of a backslider, or at least potential And in a strange way, these words are actually encouraging to me. See, here's the leader of the nation of Israel. Here's a prophet of God. Here's here's a man who was leading other people in their faith. He has a moment of weakness. He has a crisis in his life. And I want to suggest to you, if you've ever had this moment of doubt or this tinge of uncertainty, don't be ashamed. God can handle it. You see, it's common. In fact, let me suggest to you that that faith and doubt are not opposites. Now, belief and disbelief are opposites, but there's this certain sense in which faith and doubt are on a continuum. And there are going to be moments when you have strong faith, and there are going to be moments when you have some doubts. And so some moments when you have strong faith, some moments when you have weak faith. We could say it the other way. Some moments where you have strong doubts, and sometimes those doubts aren't as weak. They're on a continuum. If we know for certain, it's really not faith. And so the very essence, the very nature of faith is also this wondering and questioning. And I'm going to suggest to you that's not wrong. In fact, that's good. In fact, I'm going to suggest to you that that's what we should be doing. We should be questioning. Paul's going to write, test everything, keep what's good. And if somebody's saying, look, just believe me and just trust me and encourages you not to check things out, I'm going to say that's blind faith. It's also irrational faith. Doubt 
and faith are not opposites that are on this continuum. And we all have moments where we need to stop and question. And so don't be ashamed. The nature of the fa- uh, faith, that's a, there's a sense in which there's always a tension between faith and doubt. They're not opposites. In fact, show me the one who's never doubted. I think I can show you a person that's never believed, truly. One of our former worship ministers here now is one of our church planters in Middleton, Mike Whitford. He, he sent this to me, knowing that I was going to preach on this passage. He says, every Christian needs to wrestle with doubt and disbelief. A faith unquestioned is no faith at all. And I think he's exactly right. That faith really is looking and examining the evidence and checking it out, making sure it's true. I want to tell you that I believe not because I've never doubted. I believe because I've worked through my doubts. And I'd even say it's stronger than that. You see, I believe the Bible because every area of the Bible which can be tested, it can be trusted. And so you stop and you look at your Bible and you test those places and see, are they accurate? And in every area where it can be tested, it can be trusted. And that takes me to the point where, okay, in those areas that can't be tested, they could be trusted as well. And so doubt, it's common to all of us, and it's not a bad thing, especially if it leads you to faith. In fact, go back and look through the people of the Bible, and you're going to find out people who question their faith. In fact, some of our great heroes are also some of the ones that doubted God most. Let me give you an example, hand chosen by God. Satan comes along and says, hey, here's a righteous man. The reason why he's righteous is because you've given him everything. And God says, okay, let's check that out. Take my servant Job. And remember Job? Job has some pretty big questions of God. He has some times of wrestling and struggling with God, and yet we know he shines through all those questions, and he comes out stronger on the other side. That's Job, a great hero of faith. Or we're reading the Psalms. We know that nearly half the Psalms are written by David. Go through the the book of Psalms, and you're going to see David questioning God. Sometimes he's even angry at God. He points his finger at God and says, God, why are you allowing this to happen? David certainly has doubts, and yet the Bible says... He's a man after God's own heart. We can go and look at one New Testament example, actually somebody handpicked by Jesus himself to be a follower. And when we refer to him, we call him Doubting Thomas. You see, God's big enough to handle our doubts and concerns. And here's what you need to realize. God's got broad shoulders, and we have doubts. We've got questions. We've got concerns. We've got anxieties. I am suggesting that as we read through this psalm, it's okay. Have you been there? You have. God's big enough to handle those things. What matters is what you do with those doubts. I love the story of one man whose son is struggling. He comes to Jesus and says, look, if you have any, uh, anything you can do, and Jesus kind of looks and says, what are you saying if? Don't you know who I am? And he says, if you you believe, your son will be healed. And I love the the words of Mark chapter 9 as this man responds. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And so as we look at this passage, I want to tell you that it's okay to have some doubts. We've had those. We're going to learn some things about doubt and what we should do with our doubts. Asaph, a leader of the church, a prophet, had doubts. You see, his doubts stemmed from this. He looked at life, and then he thought about God, and the two didn't seem to meet. He thought, God, you're a great God. You're a good God. And then he looked around at life, and he saw bad things happening. And so he saw this apparent contradiction. God, if you're such a great God, why does so much bad happen? And so his assumptions didn't square with reality. And let me ask you a question. What do you do when your assumptions about God and what you see happening in life around you don't meet in the middle? What do you do when it seems like there's this contradiction Well, that's what Asaph struggled with. And so he comes to a point in his life where his assumptions about life really cause him to want to throw in the towel. And we'll see the the cause of his doubt. He's shaken to the very core. A leader of Israel. We see that this, that shakes him. And I want you to notice verses 3 through 12. So as we read, picking up the story in verse 3, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They had no pangs until death. Their bodies were fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them with a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with folly. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens. Their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, as people turn back to them and find no fault in them, 
And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge of the most high? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. Asaph looked around and he saw this disparity between, I think a God is a God of love, I think God's a God who cares about us, and yet he looks around and he sees the, the wicked prospering and the righteous suffering. He looks at the wicked in particular, and he says things. They have no struggles, they have no sickness, they have no burdens, they have no concerns in life. They've got great wealth. You look around, you see wicked people prospering. You say, that's not right, God. And he had these questions, if God's in control and if God's a good God, why does he allow this to happen? You see, if God's a good God, the plans of the wicked should flounder. The, 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 the wicked people should be punished and the godly people are the ones who should prosper. He looked around at life and he thought, God's a good God. He blesses those people who serve him and yet, why do I see so many righteous people suffering or why do I see these scoundrels getting rich? And so he looked around and he knew what it should be like and that's not what he saw. And I want to suggest it's not what we see either. We see scoundrels getting rich. We see degenerate people. We see rock stars and movie stars and TV stars. We see athletes and politicians. Wicked. Some of them very wicked. And yet they're adored by people. They get rich. They're put up on pedestals. You see that, don't you? see people that really we should be despising and yet we hold them up as our idols. We see criminals who get rich, criminals taking advantage of other people. And not only do they not get caught, they actually have great success. Or even when they do get caught, they write books about it and make millions more. That's just not fair, is it? And it's not just the famous people either. You rub shoulders with people who they cheat and they steal and they take advantage of other people and they get promoted and you don't. See, people who are dishonest, and yet they're elevated, and maybe even because they're dishonest, they get the promotion because they fudge the books. Well, you won't. And you think, God, why don't you care? What are you going to do about this? And it creates a crisis in faith. God, that's not how things should be. And so he experiences this doubt, and we find out the cause of doubt is he's looking, and the wicked people seem to be getting ahead, and the righteous people they're being crushed and being held down and it gets worse because actually as we read through this, Asaph takes a look at his own life and we see this result of doubt and I want you to notice what happens with Asaph. Right in the middle of this passage, verse 13, he looks at his own life and he says, all in vain have I kept my heart clean. I've washed my hands in innocence. God, I've been living a righteous life. I've been doing everything you want me to do. I've been, I've been playing by the rules, and yet I'm suffering, and these wicked people are getting ahead. Have you ever felt like that? I have. God, why are things like they are? Aren't you going to do anything about it? And he has this crisis in faith. These, these words are like a hammer blow. In vain, I've kept my hands pure. And again, it's because of this discrepancy between the righteous and the wicked. In my own life, I can look back and see some of the people that I went to school with. If you looked up pagan in the dictionary, you'd see their picture. <laughs> and they haven't played by the rules. And yet, big homes and fancy cars and highfalutin positions, not that those things are wrong, but it is wrong when you get there the way they have. I've had people that I, haven't went with, I went to Bible college with who have, well, they've turned their back on God and they've gone out and done detestable things and been very successful at it. And I think, God, that's not fair. I work hard. I make sacrifices. I love unlovable people. Of course, not any of you there. <laughs> I love sometimes unlovable people who sometimes throw my love back in my face. In fact, some of the people I've tried to help most have been the ones who have rejected most violently. And it's not just me. You know that too, don't you? People you've tried to show compassion and love and concern for and you get hate in return. You faced it in other areas as well. You have had times, maybe at work, where someone else was promoted over you even though they were really unrighteous. Or maybe your kids in sports have been overlooked because they weren't really willing to bend the rules. And we look around and we see dishonesty and lack of integrity, and those people sometimes seem to be the ones that get promoted. And so we understand this, and Asaph picks, paints this picture for us. I like the language he uses. Actually, I don't like it. I just think it's accurate. 
He uses language like the wicked, they wear gold medals around their neck. And the righteous, notice the language, they crawl and limp and they stumble in this race of life. It's just not fair. Why, why do I go through all this, God? Why don't you help me out here? Well, he experiences a time of doubt. And honestly, our doubts often exaggerate our perception. It's not really as bad as we think it is, but in moments of doubt, it's far worse. And then we think about Asaph. He's the spiritual leader of Israel. What do you do then? I mean, who does he turn to? These spiritual leaders, the spiritual leaders aren't supposed to doubt. They're supposed to give advice when we doubt. They're the ones supposed to help us when we struggle. They've got all the answers. What happens when the leader becomes the doubter? Where does he go? And then we read verse 15. He says, if I'd said, I'll speak thus, I'd have betrayed the generation of your children. So it gets much deeper because if he actually admits he's doubting or he goes to his congregation and says, look, here's what I'm struggling with, he realizes the ramifications that might have. And so he's doubly depressed. Not only am I struggling, but I can't tell anybody about it. And so here's a man, the leader who is the doubter. What does he do? Where does he go? To whom does he turn? That's a big problem. But listen carefully. Sometimes the most obvious answer is the right one. Where does he turn? Well, he turns to God. See, God can handle the problem. In fact, God's gonna invite each of us personally to come to him with our doubts and our concerns and our problems and our frustrations and our anger and our turmoil and our hardships. We're supposed to bring those to God because he's a big God, he's a great God, he is concerned and God can handle it. Don't think that he's gonna cash uh, uh, it in on you if you say, God, I'm struggling here. Actually, God wants to come to your rescue. You see, God wants us to come to him. I realize sometimes it's the last place we want to go. When we're doubting, we don't want to turn to God, but that's what we need to do. And as we read through this psalm, we can relate with Asaph's problem. But I want you to also notice the cure. We see the cure for his doubt. And we see this psalm take a turn When it gets to verse 16 and verse 17, we find out what happened to Asaph. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. He's struggling until something happens. He really is being burdened by this until something happens. He has a change of perspective. You see, we all question it's not, it's not a question if we'll have doubts. It is a question of what we will do with those doubts. Are we willing to go to the sanctuary? And I want you to notice again that word until. Until I went to the sanctuary of God. Where does the change take place? In the sanctuary. Now, let's stop there just for a second. He takes things to the sanctuary. It's not like he hadn't been in church before. He'd been there every week. In fact, it might have even been part of the problem. Can I actually say that? He was going through the motions. He was going to church. He was going through the exercises. He was leading that, but his heart was far away. And so we realize he actually has this change of perspective, not the fact that he goes to church, but he goes to church with a different attitude. He goes to church with a different mindset. He says, God, what about this? He takes this doubt to God, and all of a sudden things change. He realizes he's been looking at things, well, wrongly. And we get down to verse 18, and we find out what happened. He goes and brings his complaint to God, and he says, Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they're destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. He gets this new perspective. He's been looking at the world and said, The wicked... Uh, they're, they're, they're getting rich. The wicked have it. They've got the world by the tail. He thinks the rich, rich have it or the made. The wicked have it made until he realizes that's kind of short-sighted. And I want to suggest to you that often the wicked do get what's coming. Even in this life, their wickedness catches up with them. You know that, right? You've seen that happen. We realize that it's not everything it's cracked up to be. In fact, we see people that are chasing the American dream and we think people are going after treasures and pleasures and they're trying to go after the latest gizmo and gadget and we realize that sometimes those things do bring momentary satisfaction but they don't bring lasting happiness. 
And more than that, those people that chase those things, often they're the most unhappy people we know. Is that true or not true? But I want to say, even if that's not true, you think God doesn't know? You think God doesn't care? You think God's not going to do anything about that? Actually, Asaph gets this change of perspective. Actually, those people who are chasing all the things of life and going after all the happenings and the trimmings of life, guess what? Their day's coming because God does know and he realizes the outcomes of their life and it won't be so pleasant. We realize the outcome and all of a sudden there's a change in Asaph where he says, don't envy the wicked, pity them. In fact, Jesus says it this way. There's a broad way that leads to destruction. There's a narrow way that leads to life. And you realize what's going to happen to those people who are wicked and pursuing the wrong things. We need to pity them. We need to pray for them. We need to preach to them, not envy them. You see, their life is not at all what it's cracked up to be. And so he gets this perspective change. He realizes what is going to happen. And he says, man, I wouldn't go there for a moment when you realize what will happen. But more than a perspective change, his relationship with God is transformed. And he realizes, no matter what happens to me in my life, God will be with me. In good times and bad times, in, in struggles and turmoil and in the joys of life, God's right there with me. And when you start thinking about that, that God promises he will never leave us and never abandon us, would you really trade in the presence of God in your life for the trappings of this world? Would you rather pursue the American dream or would you rather be able to stand up confidently and say, God is with me, he's beside me, and he's got my back? And his perspective has changed. He realizes no matter what happens, God is with me and life is hard. Actually, life is hard for everyone. I'd rather go through life with God and go through life without him. And that's the proper perspective. And then we get down to verse 23, verse 24. Read them carefully. Asaph says, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. It's literally the language of the heavenly father reaching down and grabbing a small child and walking with them. You see that, right? You can relate. The father reaching down and saying, it's okay, I'm going to walk with you. Or maybe even taking up the little child and embracing him in his arms and saying, everything will be okay. And Asaph comes to this point where he realizes, God, I now realize you're continually with me and I'm with you. You hold my hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. You see, no matter what happens in this life, we've got this promise. There's a better life coming. It's not about just the here and now. It's not about seeking pleasure now. It's actually about spending eternity with God. And those people who are chasing after the wrong things, those things are temporary at best. They will not last, but more than that, they're trading in something very temporary for the eternal. And we start realizing that, it should change our perspective. God, I would never abandon you for all the riches in the world, for all the glories in this life. I would trade that a moment to have glory with you. And so the psalm that begins with some of the strongest doubts in Scripture, it ends with some of the most beautiful language in the Bible. And I want you to pick it up at verse 25 and notice what Asaph writes. Whom I have in in heaven but you. And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish You put an end to everyone who's unfaithful to you. But for me, it's good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of your works. A complete change of perspective. We've got God. We can look forward to a life with him. We can put our trust in him. Whom is there besides him? What would you rather have? My, my life can fall apart. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. He's my portion forever. His unfailing love, his mercy, his grace towards us, it makes it worth it. Paul says, my light and momentary troubles pale in comparison to knowing this one thing, to Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, that's the proper perspective. We realize who God is and what he has done for us. 
And Asaph, when he struggles, he's shaken to the very core. Here's what he does. He learned to bring his doubts to God. A God who's big enough and strong enough and faithful, who cares about you, who can really help. So it's not if, if we have doubts. We will have doubts. Sometimes we'll have doubts that'll shake us to our very core. What matters is what we do with our doubts. And actually, if we take our doubts and we actually look for answers and resolution and we're willing to turn to God and say, what about this? I believe you'll actually come out on the other side stronger because of your doubts. And that's what happens to Asaph. I want you to notice what Asaph did, and I want to, I want to give that to you as a recommendation for what we should do when we have doubts. Just go down through your passage and notice the, the things he does. First of all, he pledges to be with God. He goes and enters the sanctuary and says, okay, God, here's my questions, here's my doubts. He desired God alone. He chose to be near God. He took refuge in God. That's what you need to do. You've got doubts. I know you do. You've got concerns, of course. Problems and frustrations, bring them to God. God, I know you can handle these, and so won't you help me out with these? And he will do that. But I also want you to notice what else Asaph did. He decided that he would tell of all God's works to other people. I'm suggesting to you that's what we need to do as well. You see, we live in a world that's chasing the American dream. They're seeking pleasure, things and happenings, and they're coming up empty. Do you know why? They're missing the very thing they need. They need a relationship with God. And our responsibility should be to tell of his works and say, there's help for that. Well, not only notice what Asaph did, but I want you to notice in this passage what God will do. And I want to promise you, he'll do these things for you if you take your doubts to him. Notice as we look through this passage, here's how God responds. He says, he'll hold our hand, he'll guide us with counsel, he'll receive us to glory, he'll strengthen our hearts, he'll be our portion. And even as we get towards the end, he'll put an end to the unfaithful. You see, we need to have a change of perspective and realize what would you trade? What would you forfeit for your soul? And we realize that God has provided for us. He's already met our deepest needs. In fact, we know something that Asaph never knew. We knew that God actually does come and provide for our deepest needs through Jesus Christ. A God who enters into the world of frustration and doubt and problems and pain and suffering and a Jesus who comes down and becomes a curse for us so we can find rescue and I want to suggest to you that when you go and you experience times of doubt, when you think God doesn't care, remember he loved you enough to send his only son to come and be a very real help to you. Have doubts? You will. The question is, what, what will you do with those doubts? Have doubts that are shaking the very foundation of your faith? Don't be ashamed. God's not. He's not going to turn his back on you. What you need to learn to do when you come to a point, a crisis of faith, what you need to do is bring those doubts to God. Which brings me back to verse one. You thought I forgot about it, didn't you? Verse one, truly God is good. He says, truly God is good to Israel, but I want to tell you it extends beyond that. Truly God is good to those who are pure in heart. You see, it will be worth it all. We need to change perspective. The righteous, God knows God cares, God helps, it'll be worth it all. Would you pray with me? Father, I wanna come before you. What a great passage to realize we're not alone in our doubts and discouragement. Uh, that even a great leader like Asaph, well, he goes through the same things, but help us learn from him and realize that when we go through times of doubts and struggles and frustrations, those are okay, but what we need to do is bring those to you for a new perspective. And so help, uh, help encourage us and help strengthen us. And Father, hold our right hand as we put our lives into, well, into your control. Father, come and guide us and strengthen us and help us become the kind of people that you created us to be in the first place. And so Father, help us, especially when we doubt. And that's our prayer. We pray this in the blessed name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.